if I heard something and maybe people are already listening and I think we're already live on YouTube. I think the minute before the race, you said you, you normally lie on your back in the water, you smile to yourself. Wolfie, you, you really it. did your research uh, really, uh, really good. You listen. Yes. You must have listened to all the, the, yes. the podcasts I have done in the last couple of uh, weeks, and those were quite a lot. Yes, um, uh, I always try to 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 do this because for me it's it's very important. On the one hand side, um, the first, I mean, it's kind of crazy. Imagine the start of an eight-hour race, and you basically go all out like with everything you you have like the first 400 meter for me as a weaker swimmer are uh, probably the most important um five minutes in the whole race more or less because i really go like i go for a for 400 meter race basically but at the same time if especially uh, in a swim uh, um if you get too stiff if you get too nervous if you get too tense if you get tight then it's very difficult to to swim fast. So at the one hand, on the one hand side, of course, you need this this tension and you need this this energy and this motivation and you need to be pumped up and and ready to to suffer a lot and and so on. But at the same time, you also need to be relaxed. And so I try to find this this balance. And I also try to be in the right place with my mind um, and really appreciate um, and remind myself um, that I've done all this training just for for this moment for for this important race and um, I know a lot of people and um, their mindset is very difficult to understand because they they see the race as a burden or something like that you know uh, a chance mm -hmm. for failure and I always try, of course, it's not that, that easy to, to look at it uh, uh, in, a, in a different way. But I also try, I always try to look at this as a chance for success, not a, a chance for failure. And um, so therefore, yes, I always <laughs> um, lie on my back and um, uh, float around in the water a little bit and try to bring my heart rate down a little bit and then, uh, yeah, hopefully be ready for a good race. Fantastic. That's a good start. Listen, I want to say thank you very much. We start now officially already. You already <laughs> was in, in the flow. Um, I want to say thank you very much for taking the time, Sebastian. I think it's really fantastic. Uh, we start our, we have a lot of cyclists on our show now and you're the first stride lead and we, we start with a bang. And I think the reaction from the whole community in Dubai, in the Middle East has been just amazing. I think you really um, a, a character of the scene and everybody really was excited uh, we, we we didn't get from anyone as many reactions from from the public when we announced sebastian is going to be on the show that was really amazing and um i just want to acknowledge you as well because maybe some listeners i, I was i was surprised to see this you won uh, obviously the world championship in hawaii 2014 long course you won 70.3 world champion 2012 2013 Ironman European champion 2014, 2016, 2017. Then second place is Hawaii uh, World Championship. World Championships again uh, for 70.3. You won multiple challenge road events, Heilbronn, Summary in Turkey. Um, your first long distance challenge event was in Roth in 2010. And I think you smashed the 10 year old cycling record in four hour and 14. And you were the first rookie ever uh, to finish an event in 7.59.06, which I think is just an unbelievable, unbelievable. It makes you, I think, one of the, the legends of the sports. And um, I think you're, for me, I follow the sport because obviously you're a Scott athlete. You're really uh, humble and a really cool guy. Uh, the way you do the sport, obviously, you're known as an Uber biker, which has, I think, over the years has changed to be a, as well a very strong swimmer and cyclist. And um, I want to give a shout out to our cycling community or the triathlon community with Tri Dubai. Because they're they are really uh, growing the sport and, and it has been an amazing journey we have seen uh, in the past years. So I want to welcome you and uh, acknowledge you for all your achievements. Thanks a lot, uh, Wolfie, for for having me. And you are a legend yourself, uh, that's for sure. Especially in the in the cycling world, but also in the triathlon community, you are very well known because all the people ask me, "Have you seen this bike?" And I say always. Yes, um, I actually know the guy who is doing this crazy, crazy build. And 
I don't know if Instagram knows my preferences really well, but <laughs> all the time uh, your bike seemed to to pop up in my in my search uh, history, and mm -hmm. uh, so therefore it's it's still the same for me. It's, I still love the um, yeah all the, the the things that come along with the sport, especially uh, of course um, uh, bikes. It's still still something I, I started to love when I was very young and um, I still love it. <laughs> very good, fantastic. We have one little, or we have actually two clips prepared to give people a bit of a feeling uh, uh, how a day in, in your office looks like. So I hope uh, this, this will work. And Will, now it's your time to show us the clip. Thank you very much, Will. Uh, Thanks, Will. <laughs> do, you, do you remember all of the races? Do you recall? Is this quickly in your in your headspace then again? Of, of course, yes. Uh, thanks, thanks a lot for putting this together. Um, especially in those days, uh, it brings it brings some some motivation and definitely brings my my heart rate up a little bit. Yes, I I definitely know uh, pretty much all of the of the clips you showed. Yeah, the last clip is uh 2012 70.3 and i think i don't know if people saw it you're overtaking the the field of leaders you you don't overtake kind of uh, the people behind it it's you, you're passing the first group of riders on a bike and it looks like they're standing they all had a puncture or you were going so much faster than everyone else um yeah well in i think the first of all you you rarely see a, a move like this in a triathlon um i think that's the reason why it sort of became a little bit um iconic <laughs> because yes. uh, it's it's more a cycling style attack i would say so um usually because you have you, you're not allowed to draft in in long course uh, triathlon or a middle distance uh, triathlon you can also just attack basically from the front because you already have a gap. You don't have to, you know, open up a gap to, mm -hmm. you know, bridge the people behind. But um, obviously, um, it's it's sort of a of a mental um, thing as well. If you if you pass the people like this, first of all, you really make a statement, and second of all, you also make your statement for yourself. Like you start to feel strong, you get pumped, and uh, and but also it. It, I think if you make a decisive move like this, if you go by it really hard, then often it doesn't really lead to, to, a, to a reaction from the pack because the first guy, he doesn't want to pull like the other 20 guys behind him along. You know, there's no team tactics involved. There's no team that will sacrifice one of their domestiques to close down the gap. It, they are all the captains basically of their own team. So at one in, in one moment, they have to decide if I if they're gonna invest to actually pull the other guys along, and so they're looking at each other, and it's a little bit of confusion, you know. It's like the lion that goes into a herd of of this um, yeah of this uh, the spring box, and uh, and uh, and and so therefore you really you really have to sometimes you have to make a move like that, but but I have to say it wasn't that um, crazy as it looked like because it was on the downhill section and everybody uh, was really soft pedaling and I just closed the gap. Um, I head up to the swim and I was at the very back of the group and then obviously you either have to overtake the whole group 
or you wait because there's like no way that you can you know bridge in between two people that are uh, cleanly spaced that um, leads to disqualification or to time penalty so therefore you either have to overtake the whole group or you have to stay in the back and so when i start to overtake i didn't even wanted to attack to be honest i was more like okay let's go to the front but then i realized they go actually pretty slow and they they just like the front the guy in the front waited for somebody to take the lead and so on you know there was some hesitation and i just used that to my advantage fantastic fantastic no but it looks super impressive uh, and the clip is on your on your homepage. so if anyone wants to look at the clip again i think it's it's, it's there uh, so it's really cool uh, i want to take you back to the beginning and i i know your first career was more in ping pong with your brother <laughs> Um, so this this was the first thing, and then you you later got excited about triathlon. So can you tell us a bit about your who inspired you for for the triathlon? Um, yeah, like like you said, I've I've done a lot of different sports, and um, obviously as a German boy, you have to play soccer at one point. And but the thing is, I was a very active kid. Um, <laughs> Nowadays, you would probably just diagnose me with ADHD or something like that. But um, for me, team sports was very difficult. You know, I, I've never, I, I've, I never was the best guy or the most talented guy in the team, but I always was the most motivated guy in the team. And that doesn't really go to, goes too well, you know, in a team sport, because you start to see everybody else's mistakes, but not your own mistakes. And so... You know, therefore, I wasn't at that time, I wasn't a team player. Uh, interesting enough, um, I started to learn how to become a team player with triathlon. But to answer your question, we were um, at holidays with my grandma and um, there was a local triathlon nearby. And my dad um, read about it in the newspaper. And so we went there just for spectating. And right away, I was hooked. I mean, for me, uh, these guys, they looked like superheroes, you know, in their wetsuits. And they had these disc wheels. And I was so amazed as a young kid because obviously this this was sort of like heroic. And uh, so I, I wanted to be like them. And I decided, decided straight away I want to be a triathlete. And that was very, very early on. And then... Um, I mean, in fourth grade, and I still have this magazine from my uh, um, from my teacher back then. We had to write down what we want to become when we are grown up, and so uh, everybody wrote down something like astronaut or special agent or maybe just police officer or whatsoever hairdresser. <laughs> and I wrote down, I want to be a professional triathlete. <laughs> okay. And I was back then. I was nine years old, and I think there were just maybe not even two or three guys in Germany that where you can really call them a professional athlete, like making, making a living with the sport. So my teacher told me, no, no, it has to be something realistic, actually, like astronaut. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I was the only one who actually uh, um, really became what, um, uh, what they wrote down in, in yeah, more than 20, uh, 25 years back back now <laughs> very cool. crazy very cool that's a good story um you studied physics later on and um do you feel that helped you to understand like things like aero drag and the power data and all these things is this something you, you can use in your in your daily writing as well well i mean <laughs> um that's what I thought I would learn when I studied physics. I, I was really interested in like a lot of different, probably sometimes romantic uh, questions. But um, at the end, um, physics is basically just a lot of mess. And um, so at one point, I really started to, to struggle because it became uh, so... Uh, Un, for me so unrelated to the to the world you can touch and see and feel and uh, and and so therefore um you know uh i mean i i always had a, a huge fantasy and uh you know um could imagine a lot of like details and small things and and so on but um at one point of course if you really dig deep into uh, into physics 
it's not like that anymore. You can't imagine, um, you know, uh, what Einstein's uh, theory really means. Like it's it's difficult <laughs> to do that, and so therefore. Um, but yes, in, in, in a lot of ways, I mean, when I work with, with Scott, for example, and I work with the engineers, I think it's important for them to have a writer that really understands, um, you know, all the, all the details about the bike and why it's not possible to make it like that. Or um, when, when I come up with an idea, it's not something like completely crazy or so. I know, okay, this has to be cost effective. It has to be doable. It, doesn't it's not formula one where you build like one car you actually want to uh, sell it to a bike shop later on and not every body has their own mechanic traveling to races uh, with you and so on and so on and so on so i think um therefore uh, yeah i became valuable for some questions obviously i'm not an engineer um but to um, to approach a problem in in the sport in a in a in a certain way, like okay, this is the this is what we want to achieve, and that's let's make a plan and how to achieve that. I think that definitely helps. Very good. And you said as well, imagining stuff. So when you were a little boy, Sebastian, for the first couple of triathlons, who was the rider in your head? Who was your uh, your inspiration when you did your first <laughs> triathlons? Um. Uh, Back then, to be honest, you know, um, triathlon wasn't much in uh, in TV, and um, uh, you know, my parents they weren't really uh, that we didn't have a lot of money, so we just had three TV channels, <laughs> and uh, so back then the only thing we were watching sports on TV was either soccer or to the front, obviously. So of course, my uh, my heroes back then were more in the cycling world than than in the triathlon world. Um, and it was a big area era with, um, you know, of course, Armstrong versus um, Jan Ulrich. And, yeah. and even before that, I mean, I could even imagine, you know, seeing guys like Claudio Chiapucci or something, uh, somebody like that, you know, riding. <laughs> and I had a Carrera uh, jersey back then, and I was super proud of that jersey. I think it's still somewhere hiding in a closet. Um, <laughs> at home so yeah it was more in the in the cycling cycling world back then very good very good um i know you like cooking <laughs> and what's the favorite dish what's your signature dish sebastian Kini <laughs> special um i would not say that i have a signature dish to to be honest but um yeah in the last couple of weeks i definitely did some some baking <laughs> okay. Uh, um, it, I mean, you know, there were no races inside, so it's, uh, I'm still a little bit, probably two or three kilos too heavy for, for really, a, a tough race in the, in the heat. But, um, yeah, I mean, you know, eating has a lot to do with your, uh, with your, um, uh, mental state. And, uh, so I think right now is also the time where you can have a cake. So, uh, I did some pretty crazy cakes. To be honest, like uh, a strawberry um, uh, tart, where I mean it's probably 300 grams of black black chocolate, a half liter of um, um, cream, um, and yeah, so it's a it's pretty a pretty hefty one, but. Um, signature dish i would say we have uh, something it's um basically um pasta with um uh, with um, potatoes it sounds pretty strange with some dry tomatoes um but you'll you'll definitely find it somewhere uh, in the internet the recipes um i think it's i don't know from who it is but we'll post it later i'll post <laughs> a comment under the <laughs> under your stream what do you think makes you so good at triathlon? How how did you develop this this willpower and, and every determination, everything, and, and how much of it is your talent, and how much is really hard work? Well, of course, this is a big question, and at the end, um, it's not one thing that you can you know point out. Um, if you in in any sport, if you 
if you want to be at the very top for for that long it's the whole package always um obviously the the first thing is i really love what i do that's very important i think there there are people that are really really good and they ring big races but they're just just there for like one one olympic game or uh, um maybe uh, one world championship or one to the france and then they they will will be gone again because they don't really love what they do and they love the success and they love different things that come along with the success but they didn't really love the everyday work and um i also love the everyday work to be honest it's uh it's um really part of my my life and so therefore i am um, yeah i really love what i do that's important then of course you have to have talent i mean without talent it's it's very difficult to <laughs> To be at that level but then at the same time you have to maintain work for like 15 years or 20 years i mean i've doing i'm i'm doing the sport for more than 25 years now and um so that's that's important obviously then you have to be lucky sometimes it's mm -hmm. just sometimes it's just luck you know you don't or let's don't call it luck but let's call it the absence of bad luck you know i know a lot of people and they are probably more talented than me they work harder than me they have a better diet than me and so on and so on but you know fuck they got hit by a car so what do you do it's it's mm -hmm. difficult so um sometimes you have to be a little bit lucky of course and then you have to surround yourself with people that um that help you achieve what you want to achieve you know you have to have a good coach you have to have a, a good sponsors you have but most important obviously you have to have a good family you know my my parents are supporting me early on and um you know now my wife um without her it's it's basically there's no chance i mean if i imagine doing this the whole the whole sport without her it's it's very difficult so it's a lot of a lot of things and some people would call it small things but it's in in uh in at that level there's no such thing as a small thing it's all always a big thing mm -hmm. you mentioned once that you said you always have to be a little bit unhappy and and to become a little bit of ang a little bit angry to become better uh that sounds a bit like me eh? you always have to be a little bit looking for this extra and you never really and i don't know if it's unhappy but unsatisfied that you have that urge and that hunger to really wake up every morning and become a little bit better. Um, is this a key of success? Yes, I mean, 100%. I think, um, you know, if if you end a session and you think like it couldn't be done any uh, any better, then it's the end of your, uh, your career, basically, in my opinion. I mean, most of the times I, I always try to be in the state where I'm 80% happy and 20% unhappy with myself. Mm -hmm. And um, so I always know that there are things I have to do better and I can do better. And so that's what, what drives us forward. I mean, it doesn't mean that you have to be constantly driven or whatever, you know, I mean, it's, it's always a balance, like everything in life, but um, it definitely is important to not be uh, too happy with yourself too easy. I mean, even if I win a race, mm -hmm. you know, even sometimes when I won a race and I ha actually had a really good race and I won this race with five minutes in front of the second guy, it's something I will forget pretty soon, to be honest. I mean, I can't remember a lot of races where I won with five minutes ahead of the next guy, but I can remember a damn lot of races where I ended up second and um mm -hmm. i know i could have done probably something different or something better uh to win the race and and that's also the reason why you know i'm i'll be I, i've been there for more than yeah 10 years at least at the top in uh, in long distance triathlon because I think I've not won every single race, but um, uh, often that helps a lot with your progress to not win every single race. So I have a lot of respect for guys like, for example, Jan, um, who wins a lot of races or who usually wins all the races pretty much uh, because it's, it's very difficult because then you're not 
getting then you're not driven anymore by this hunger for success but you are probably driven by the fear of, of losing and that's something really hard to be honest mm -hmm. yeah, you said the sensation of losing is more motivating than winning yes for me it is um mm -hmm. i mean obviously it's also big motivation to know how it feels when you won the race but like i said um it's often that I, I had a perfect or um, close to perfect race. And then, and then uh, I forget about it pretty quickly, actually. Um, because, you know, then I basically check the box and, um, uh, you know, I can go on and I have to be the next guy. But uh, if I lose, then that, that would really sticks in my head and what I need to, uh, to work on and, yeah, I think so. Therefore, um, it always, it's like I said, it's always a balance. <laughs> it's yeah. not that I want to say I want, don't want to win the races. I mean, obviously, you want to win every race. Um, but often I realize that um, I get more motivation out of a race that I lost than one that I won. A race you have won five times is, uh, and you have been crowned the king of Buschütten, <laughs> uh, which is, a, I, I think, now a famous race because of you. We won it five times, but I think it's as well, obviously, a race in Germany, which is important to to get the, the youth interested. And, and it's a good uh, benchmark for everyone to be there. We are having to buy some some good clubs like my, to buy, my Try to Buy Club or my, my, my Try Club. They do a lot of good work for the for the youth development. So. Was this something very important to you that, that race the, the five times win of the King of Buschütten? Yeah, 100%. I think that's uh, one of the reasons why German athletes are so strong in, in the world of triathlon or especially in the world of long course or non-drafting triathlon because we have a lot of um, very strong local races. And um, so that, that's the races where the, the young guys can cut the teeth without traveling the whole world. You know, they can they can measure with some of the best athletes in the in the world you know Jan raced there for example uh, last year and um, in Buschütten in the small very mm -hmm. small um, race actually but that that's what makes the race iconic is the people that race the race and mm -hmm. that's why this small race isn't actually a small race anymore it, it became a big race because of the people that raced it and um, I think that's yeah that's one of the reasons why um there are so many strong athletes it's not just that race we have the Rheinecker cup which is also non-drafting but very very tough uh bike courses um and it's you know it's easy to travel for the athletes and um there's always uh, some tries money on the line so and it comes with a um just with a very good resume you know i mean you definitely get some good exposure because you always race against good guys you know and that's I think that's important and I always try to support those those smaller races if it's possible. Very good. Uh, your home race is Heilbronn uh, and I heard a story that all the fans were painting your name on the street uh, and on your training route you were always happy to see it but then the, I think the police called you and said okay somebody wrote your name on the road and you need to pay a big hefty fine to, to get it removed but uh, how, how is it to read your name when you go up a climb? Is this something you always get fully motivated yeah yeah 100 percent. because uh yes uh yeah it's a true story actually and um but they used um color you usually use to paint uh your house you know <laughs> so okay. therefore it's um it's something that lasts so it lasted for a really long time actually and they just didn't just painted my name they also yeah, painted some other <laughs> uh, things on there. So um, yes, and it was part of my pretty much my daily training um, loop. And uh, yes, it obviously it motivates uh, motivates me a lot um, to know that there are people that are rooting for you and cheering you on. And uh, and and I mean, even if our sport is not like a typical spectator sport. If we have spectators and also the amateurs, they, they really understand very well what it means, you know, um, because if you get respect from somebody who also just finished the Ironman, you know, who, who probably needed 12 hours, but 
done the same race, it means a lot to get respect from those people. And I mean, for example, in Hawaii, it's crazy, you know, we're, when we run the marathon and we are on Queen K highway before we turn left into the energy lab, there are always like 10, 15 people that stop on their bike and, and they are in their race, but they still stop and they, uh, they cheer us on. And, and that's amazing, you know, and I mean, uh, that's what makes our sport so special, and that's what what also helps a lot right now in the in the, in the time of a crisis, because we are not a TV sport, and I understand that it's sometimes it can be pretty boring um, for sure. But we are a part participation sport, and that's what makes our our sport uh, special. And uh, gathering respect from those people means a lot. Very good. Yeah, you said once you, you love to see all the happy faces in the in the finish area. So everybody kind of has this, this sense of <laughs> not, achievement. Not all the faces are happy there, okay. but uh, but yes, of course, it's 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 all it always reminds um, you why you started the sport. And I think that's that's also something you know um, what makes long course triathlon so special. If you if you're a professional runner and 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 let's say you you you're on a on a on a track and you run 100 meter um i mean the first thing what the people do is they look to the left because that's where the watch is and they want to see the watch and uh, if they're not you know at a certain time or if they're not won the race um you know they're not happy and <laughs> but in long course triathlon you know i mean I, I've always been happy even to just cross the finish line because it's just such a relief to, to even end the race. Of course, sometimes um, in the days after the race, you are not happy with your result. You're not happy with your time. You could have done better at this or you, you could have done that better. But in that moment where you cross the finish line, it is something very, very special. Even for us professionals, it doesn't matter if it's 8.15 and I become fifth place just to cross the line is such a relief and it's such a great thing that um you know seeing those uh, amateurs um when you come back to the finish line in frankfurt or in in ross or or in hawaii it is something very special and so therefore i always try to to be back there and uh, and hand out some some medals and give us some very sweaty hugs <laughs> because it's, it's quite motivating to see the people fantastic Please take us back to 2014. Uh, you lying on the back in the water just before the cannon shoots, and you're thinking, okay, that's the place I want to be. And then the cannon goes off. What happened in the next eight hours? Who, uh, to be honest, I think 2014. I didn't start it. Um, I didn't start the race um, as I wanted to, so I didn't float it on my back um, because um, I think I was in a in a good mindset but the weeks before the race they were just absolutely horrible to be honest um i lost all the doubt uh, the the confidence in my in myself i had a lot of doubts with my preparation i had um that was the first year when i had some really severe Ach achilles problems so i did a lot of aqua jogging instead of real running and um i think like 12 days before the race i even looked up flights back home just two days before the race because um, I thought it doesn't make any sense to actually <laughs> even start the race. Um, but then, like the moments before the race, I realized so well now you, there's nothing else you can do besides just giving your very best and try try everything you you have. And I think that also helped a lot. Um, because I was very calm, you know, I mean, um, when you have a perfect preparation leading up to a race and you have a very high expectation before the race, it sometimes leads to such an enormous um, pressure that you put on yourself that it's very difficult to really deliver. And so sometimes, and or not just sometimes, you actually see that quite often that you have people that tell you, well, I've been injured, I've been sick, whatever. And then they have absolutely great races. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's probably not because they lied to you. It's just because they, 
they they didn't have put it the pressure on themselves and that's what happened for me is i think um, when i started the race i didn't really had a lot of pressure on my on myself and that helped at the at especially at the beginning of the race because um i was very calm at the beginning of the race in the first four hours in the race the the own or the most important thing is um, first, you have to be in the right position, and I've been in. The, I, I was in the right position because, due to the fact that I wasn't running a lot, I was swimming actually quite a lot, and so that was the only thing that was going really well. Was this my swimming shape was actually quite good, so therefore my swim was okay. So I was just where I wanted to be, and and then it's just about energy saving, you know. Then you have to wait. It's basically a waiting game for four or five hours the real race starts after six, seven hours into the race. And, um, but the thing was, I think because I, I felt so, so free, um, I, I was in a very good position on the bike and I, I can remember, um, there was the other German, um, athlete. He's now living in, uh, in Tucson. Um, uh, do you know who he is? <laughs> Uh, Mike Twelsig, he was oh, also yeah. uh, with uh, Scott at that time in the in the Commerzbank uh, triathlon team, yes. and so therefore he was also very very strong on the bike. And I think I was training with him that year in Tucson, and we did quite a lot of rides together. And um, yeah, so we just we just were a really good team because even if you're not allowed to draft it still helps you a lot to have somebody else just mentally. And even with just 12 meters um, apart, you, you still profit from somebody riding in front of you. So um, it helped a lot. And then with, I think, 40, 50 K to go, uh, 40 K to go, I, I think I, uh, yeah, I still had something left. And that was an amazing feeling because um, I've never, I've never, I never felt um, that good that late in the race. I usually always already started to struggle after like 120 Ks on the bike. And so was, a lot of people told me, yeah, that was a great attack you did with like 50, 40 K to go. But usually you don't attack. It's It, it looks like you're attacking, but um, it's just the others that are struggling and fading away. So I was just able to maintain my pace and um and I think also they they sort of I I I don't want to say they let it let it me right away, but um, uh, I think um, back then it was a phase where everybody thought the the strong runners will dominate the the next couple of years, um, but that didn't really happen. Um, I think because of me, partly because of me, um, but yes, I I had quite a good good lead and I mean then I was on you know I was floating um for pretty much the first 25k on the on the run course and and then the la last 17k you can just fight through I mean um if you lead that race it's it's an amazing mm -hmm. feeling and I mean also because I had uh so much doubts and I was struggling uh, so so much before the race I was so surprised for myself and uh, how good it actually uh, actually goes that it was like a dream, you know. And so therefore, uh, it gave me so much energy during the race. And um, yeah, so I never really let it up. <laughs> Fantastic. Do you remember the moment you ran the last kilometers and then going over the finish line first? How long did it take until you really realized that you had achieved the world championship title? Well, I mean, that's the thing with an Ironman takes, uh, in this case, a little bit more than eight hours. So you have some time to actually realize that this is really going to happen. Like the last 10K before the finish line, I didn't want to say I was 100% sure because I always knew that something can happen till the very end. But at one point you realize this actually will be possible, you know, and um, so therefore... I think um, it's 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 different, you know. It's not like a huge surprise or whatsoever. Also, because for me, of course, in this year it was a surprise. But um, because the years before that have been already really good, and 
I think I was uh, also ranked world number one when I was going into that race. Um, I had a pretty bad um, race before in Mont Tremblant, but yeah, I won uh, won Frankfurt that year, and uh, so so therefore it wasn't like a huge surprise. But obviously, it's something different um, to actually deliver um, because it's a lot of great athletes um, who uh, who never succeeded in that race. For example, Andy Relot, I think um, mm -hmm. for sure a guy who is probably more talented than me and also a harder worker than me, but um, it never really fitted together for him. So it's mm -hmm. uh, it's really difficult to uh, to get it all together on that that day. So I'm very yeah very happy that it happened. Fantastic! Yeah, great achievement. Um, if you look back into your career and you look what you know today and maybe like going 15 to 20 years back, what, what advice would you give little the young Sebastian uh, and, and you wish you would have known back then? Well, um, I would not say do anything, <laughs> anything different. I think, um, you know, obviously... I, I've done mistakes and um, I think I could have won more races if I've done certain things differently, but it all it all leads to where I'm at right now. So I would not say that I would do anything really different from what I've done, you know, I mean, um, yeah. <laughs> Very good. And if you had the choice and you had a time machine and you could go forward in time or backwards, which direction would you go? <laughs> um, I think I would go forward, um, but not forward like 10 years forward. But I wanted to, wanted to see how the humans, you know, kept up in 200 years and then in 500 years and then probably in a thousand years. That would be interesting you know i mean we uh, we have a pretty good idea how the past looked like you know so therefore uh, i think i don't want to want to have a look in the past i would have loved to to look in the future but not for myself but for all the humans yeah. yeah very nice um I, i know you're really into your bikes and stuff and we prepared a second clip and, and will will show this now yeah about your bikes and the love of the technology. So I hope we can show it now. Will, again, it's your time. will wow that's an amazing machine uh we were actually very lucky to get our hands on two of your uh, replica frames and one of them is in the hands of ali and one went to marcello and they are super proud always when they walk in transition big smile <laughs> they have the machine of the world champion so um, yeah they're super happy that they got the bikes um what's what's custom i think it's almost the color has been taken off one by you have special hand cradles and stuff what, what's your favorite gadget on your bike at the moment so this bike was a special build um uh, just for 70.3 uh, world championships last year in nice and the unique thing about it was that um obviously it was a lot of climbing on this course but at the same time um the average speed was still above 40k an hour i think so the aerodynamic Uh, still was a very important factor, but at the same time, you want to uh, have the bike as light as possible. 
So that's not the bike I I ride right now or ride every day. But um, that was one of the like one offs for uh, for this race. I hope I can use it for one or two races this year with a similar uh, course profile. And yeah, I mean, it's part of it is because it is very important, you know, and because it really makes a difference. And some of the races are lost or won within a couple of seconds. And I mean, for example, like you ask me, why, why is it driving you, you know, to, to lose a race? And in Mululaba, for example, um, 2015, I think was that I became second place by just two seconds. You know, and otherwise I would have been the only guy who has three 70.3 world championship titles. And um, so sometimes really small things can make a difference. And um, so therefore um, I, I, I do this on the, with the bikes, but at the same time, it's also just because I love to do it and it, it just feels great. And it also feels great if you check in the bike and you know, in I would say 95% of all the races I've done in the last 15 years, I had the best setup or the fastest setup in in the in the pro transition area. Not um, in the whole transition area because a lot of age groupers are also very very um, dedicated when it comes to their bikes. So, um, but yeah, it's also just a passion, you know, and um, it yeah it it. It, uh, it, it's very motivating if you have a bike like that. And um, sorry, I think you asked me about the, the special gadgets the on this gadget. bike. Yes. So, what yes. What's your this... favorite piece of equipment you have? What is really something you're really excited about? I know you have a set of 858 uh, tubeless, which is yeah. not existing in the world. So <laughs> I, I was looking it up and I, I couldn't find it. And I think it's something only for the absolute best athletes in the world to get their hands on that. Yes, uh, I, I'm not sure if uh, if Sip is so excited to hear that, um, that it's already out there. But yes, obviously, um, there are uh, tubeless ready uh, um, uh, wheels from from Sip, the normal um, 808 NSW, and it's a very good uh, wheel set. But um, yeah, they basically, I think what they did is they took the, the rim, um, uh, like the basic rim, and just made the profile from the 858 on that on that rim and uh yeah so therefore it's it's tubeless ready and um uh, i switched to to schwalbe um last year and it's it's amazing their um yeah their r d is is really really good and they listen a lot to the athletes and um if if there is like any any input like it's so crazy how fast they they are able to to bring a new tire and um they always try to bring up a new tire sometimes especially for one race um and that's that's something really cool because tires they make a huge difference especially in triathlon i know a lot of people are ah, tubeless is this really a good thing but you know especially in triathlon it's um the problem is uh you don't have a team car behind you and you can't make a wheel change within 20 or 40 seconds and um, so therefore puncture resistance is really important but at the same time rolling resistance is also really important and weight is also really important uh, so therefore end comfort is also really important mm -hmm. actually uh, especially when you're on the aero bus for 180k and you probably have a bike course that's not 100% um, uh, smooth um, the vibrations can be really, really hard on your body. And it's actually sometimes faster if you have a little bit of a lower pressure. Yes. And um, uh, so therefore, uh, tubeless uh, allows that to do. So yes, I'm happy that um, Sip was able to make this wheel as a tubeless ready wheel, but I'm pretty sure it doesn't, will not take too much longer uh, for them to bring this out to the, to the um, wider, wider public. Very good. And if you race, is it something you are determined by the power meter very much, or is it a lot you race by feel? Yeah, um, up until last year, I actually never raced with a power meter because um, I always believe that, you know, having these numbers and, you know, from your training rides and from your tests and from your, from your performance tests, what, what you can possibly deliver. And I always believe that this will actually set yourself a limit, you know, because, you know, if I, if I'm able to ride 300 Watts mm -hmm. for, uh, 
for four hours, you know, um, you probably don't want to cross that, you know, and I see a lot of people that raced um, with the power meter and that also limits their tactical uh, understanding of the race a little bit, because instead of like trying to close the gap as fast as possible or open a gap as fast as possible, they look to the power meter and say like, ah, yeah, but I don't want to exceed 350 watts because um, otherwise I burn too much carbs or whatsoever. So therefore, I think it's sometimes it's really important to forget about the power meter and just like go full out, full tilt, <laughs> whatever. And, you know, make a decision with your, with your heart is very important sometimes in a race um because you i mean that's that's what happened at the end of 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 a of a great race is actually you surprise yourself you better than you thought you can be you 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 put a new personal best but if you already know that's my limit and i don't mm -hmm. want to exceed this limit you're never going to exceed your limit at the other on the other hand obviously <laughs> after the bike there's a run and you can still run faster if you have some energy left so you have to find a balance you know i mean um right now i'm racing with the power meter uh, mainly because also my coach just wants to to see the numbers and wants to um, fine tune all the all the training and so on and i totally understand that but sometimes um i I find it a little bit devastating, especially also if you have a bad race, for example, and you look at the power meter and you see like you're way off, like you, 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 you're 30, 40 watts lower than you thought you can be or whatsoever. It gives you like a really bad um, feeling, you know? So therefore sometimes I think it would be better to just maybe record the data, but don't race like always looking at your power meter. But, um, you know, everybody's different. So I think at the end, um, the solution is really you have to find the best of both worlds. You know, at some point in the race, you have to forget about the power meter and just go with your heart and race with your heart. But to a certain extent, you have to race with your brain and you have to race like by looking at your power numbers and so on. Very good, very good. I have one comment from Ian and he said, Yep. He wants to see another performance like the one we saw in the little movie from uh, <laughs> Las Vegas. I said, just go and, and smash them to pieces in the bike course. Just yeah. pass them. Um, to be honest, the thing is, I mean, obviously, um, a lot of people ask me um, if, I, if I'm not as aggressive anymore on the bike or uh, if I uh, probably lost some of the, the power I had when I was uh, 26 or 20, uh, 27. Um, and I would say, yes, of course, sometimes it is like that. You definitely lose a little bit of uh, your aggression and you try to use a little bit more your brain and, and so on and so on. But at the same time, you know, when you look at, let's say, 2013 Ironman Hawaii World Championships, you know, um, my position and my equipment was so much better than pretty much everybody else on the pro field. And of course, because of that, you know, that's how the, the sport develops is everybody looks at the best guy, you know, and I think I had the fastest bike split by five minutes, but I had a flat tire, which costed me like five minutes. So I had the fastest bike split probably by 10 minutes. And it's like you said, in, in Ross, I broke the, I think, 10 year, years old, um, yeah, world's best um, uh, bike split from uh, from Jürgen Zeck at that time. And that was not because I was the strongest um, cyclist, but it was because I had the best equipment and the best position, and I was probably riding the smartest. And of course, at one point, everybody starts to copying you and everybody starts to realize, oh, it's actually important. It's not just cool or whatever a hobby or blah blah no it's actually important and um they don't want to get their ass kicked like that anymore so therefore they also start working like this and so therefore it became more and more difficult obviously and the other guys are also training their butt off so it's not that easy anymore to make a move like that um because other people will react now they will not let you ride away anymore and it's also when you had some success you know you are marked it's <laughs> Everybody knows when this guy goes, 
Very he's cool. not coming back. He's actually uh, he will maintain that lead and he will win the race. Back then, I would say some of them just thought like, ah, yeah, let him ride away. He's stupid. We are gonna catch him on the run. He is gonna he's gonna explode. He's stupid. So now not anymore. So it's it's more difficult now. <laughs> yes. You have a new coach with with Philip Side, and I think Philip worked uh, with a lot of different sports, uh, ice hockey, uh, football, and all these things. And and um, I think you you as well. He helped you a lot to to work on your running, and I think your running has become really one of one of the strength now. Yeah, but you're you're obviously known as an Uber biker, but I think the running, and you said you really enjoyed running again. So can you give us a few secrets of what, what has changed and, and what has changed with Philip? What's the new things you're doing? So um, first of all, um, yeah, since 2014, I, st I, I had a lot of problems with my Achilles left and right and uh, in different phases, you know, um, it was horrible at some point, you know, so therefore I lost a lot of joy running because when you wake up in the morning and you are just limping to the toilet and everything you know is just feeling really bad it's not it's not <laughs> really enjoyable so um i think one of the great things about philip is that he is a great manager when it comes to performance managing you know so He, uh, he's not just um, a good coach, but he knows the people, you know, that will would be able to help you, you know. So um, I know some coaches and they think they know everything, you know. They, uh, they are an expert in, in nutrition. They are an expert in, in equipment and they are an expert in swimming and in cycling and in running and so on. But Philip is not like that, you know. He knows, um, for example, he's probably not... The best when it comes to coaching swimming technique for example so therefore he uh, he tries to look for help and that's the same with mm -hmm. when it comes to the the problems with the killers is like he starts to read everything every study that there is out there and um but then at the same point time he uh, he try he tries to make a lot of calls you know he tries to get um this doctor or that doctor and have a look on it and 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 that that was really important and then also just i mean not that i didn't try to you know work on it in the in the four or five years before i went to philip but i the, the problem was also that i had the physio i had a, you know the the a doctor a nutritionist and so on but they sometimes they didn't know <laughs> what the left the right hand wasn't didn't know what the left hand was doing so so to say so with philip he started to get connected like to all those people and um that was important and then i mean uh, what we what we have done differently i think um we started to make really make a list um what works so for me i started to use some pretty esoteric things uh, when it comes to trying to cure the, the killers um, because I was really, uh, yeah, I lost all hope more or less. Um, uh, but he was like, okay, this is scientifically proven. We start with this. Mm -hmm. Then it's the next thing. Like what's the next thing that is probably scientifically proven. And then we do the next thing. And I was doing like all the things, but um, not in the right order. And the most, the most important thing was, first of all, we started to try to find out, okay, what's the, the pro what is causing the problem? And one of the biggest problems was for sure my, my back. I think what makes me a strong cyclist, you know, that I'm able to maintain this aero position for a very long time um, is not very helpful when it comes to running because your, your spine is also some sort of a dumper. And if it can't um, work properly, it's, it's pretty difficult. So we, uh, we started to work a lot on just like my um, um, gister when I'm running, you know, like I, I was trying to run more, um, more like a little bit more forward, like my feet a little bit more backwards, not running too much on the heel. And then 
um, I, I'm starting to getting uh, special shoes from uh, from New Balance that um, had less load on the on the heel. And a very important thing was eccentric um, load training for the Achilles, but in in the right way. I also have a YouTube uh, video on this. You can mm -hmm. you can uh, check that out. But um, yes, and then I also sometimes it's just small things in the right direction. For example, I did this eccentric load training before, but I probably did it a little bit wrong, like, um, and therefore it did more harm than, than good to the Achilles. And then a lot of other small changes. And then, but the most important thing at the end is just patience, unfortunately. <laughs> so back then, um, I was always like, okay, in like six weeks from now, I have the next race. So I wanted to be fit for this race. And so I, I, I tried to ignore the pain and, um, you know, just kept, kept uh, running. And when I was with Philip, he asked me, okay, so what is your goal? Like, what do you want to do in the next four years? And I said, like, yeah, I want, obviously I want to win another Kona World Championship title. And he said, like, yes, okay, but then we have to now take a break for like eight weeks, no running at least. And then it became like three months and it wasn't better and it wasn't better. And I was freaking out. And I mean, I, I, I didn't lost hope, but I was like, Fuck, this is not going to end. Well, I probably have to just quit my career. But at the end, mm -hmm. I'm now 100% pain free. And so that's something, something very important. You have to be patient. And that's very difficult for a lot of people. Yeah, very good. Very good. Fantastic. I think it's interesting when somebody comes in from different sports, uh, obviously you're surrounded by triad leads and triad lead coaches and you look what the triad leads are doing and somebody somebody comes in from a different industry almost and he brings new ideas and I, I think this can this can really be a key factor to to change things yeah, and look at these things and I think the combination of different uh, people that they talk to each other and make it really a team effort uh, that's going to be an interesting approach I'm, I'm excited to see you race in in, in, uh, in Hawaii soon yeah um I had one question from a person I really want to give a shout out. His name is Romeo. He's an ultraman. He does double distance stride. On, and not only is he doing this, he's as well a first responder, um, which I really admire people who are at, at, the, at the scene of an accident and helping people. So Romeo, shout out to you here. Uh, he said, uh, Sebastian, what's your favorite and most memorable race? Oh, um, that's really difficult to say. I mean, obviously, the easy answer is 2014 in Hawaii, but um, I tend to say it was actually uh, the first world championship title in, in Vegas. Um, because, you know, that really came, I would not say like a big surprise, but, you know, it's, it's something different to, to have an achievement like that for the very first time, because after that, it's never be the same again, 100%, because after that, you will always have expectations and, you know, pressure. And um, that's, that's the problem with winning, you know, I mean, when you, when you want to race once and next year you'll end up third place or second place, it's not enough anymore, you know. So uh, therefore, I would say, yes, um, that was a very memorable uh, race for me. But um, there are so many really uh, memorable races for me. Also, I mean, winning uh, Samori in the championship um, last year in 2019, for example, was very, very important for me because I had a really, I didn't have a good day, you know, I actually had a really, really bad day, to be honest. And, but I realized how, how strong I, I'm still, uh, I can still be um just by you know using using my willpower and also because it was this like first race with the first big race with the with my new coach and uh, you know realizing i can win this race on the run was like really really important and then also i mean yeah there are so many races but um sometimes it's not even linked to winning you know for example uh the race in Nizza last year, 70.3 World Championship. Of course, I ended up fifth place, which wasn't, yeah, which wasn't great. And uh, I mean, 
yeah, after winning two two seventy point three World Championships titles, becoming uh, second for three times, you're not gonna be happy with the fifth place. But I was running faster than Christian Blumenfeld, than uh, Javi Gomez, um, uh, and and uh, yeah, and uh, so and and therefore and and Alistair Brownlee, for example, and therefore it was for me it was something that I proved myself that I'm still able to develop with the age of 35 and become, you know, one of the best runners in the, in the sport. And that helped me a lot by, you know, to, to stay motivated for the next, for the next months and years to come, uh, that there's, that it, that it's still possible to improve. Great. Great. I have one more question coming in from Marcello. He's one of the owner of the bike and he's a super <laughs> stylish Italian gentleman. Um, so regards to you, Marcello. Uh, what else you do in life besides running? What are your hobbies? Well, <laughs> that's the problem. If you make your your hobby your job, you don't have any hobbies anymore. But at the same time, if you make your hobby your profession, you don't have to work anymore. <laughs> so it's really a two-sided sword. But um, I would love to say I have some really exciting hobbies. But at the end, it's I read a lot. Um, I love to, to read like not just uh, books and fiction, but a lot of newspaper and just, you know, still a lot of uh, scientific um, books um, because it's my, it's, it's a way for me to, to, to uh, switch off the sport, you know, and try to keep the mind busy with, with something else than, uh, than sport. And that's re really important because um, especially in triathlon, you know, the job is, is 24 seven, you know, it never stops. Um, it's important how you sleep. It's important what you eat. It's like, the, you know, what you do before training, um, everything, whatever. If I want to go drive my go-kart, for example, mm -hmm. before I go to swim, the swim session would probably be pretty shitty because I'm, I will be so sore and banged up that it's, it's difficult. So Therefore, it's, it's really difficult because everything influences your performance. So the job is 24-7. But yeah, I, I like to, to read a lot. And of course, um, you know, just um, being with my, with my family is, is very important, especially at this, um, these times. Today, we have been to the zoo. <laughs> so, um, and then the, the, the next thing is... Um, I think what I really enjoy is, um, is, is a lot of small things like coffee, for example. I mean, it's not something special. Everybody seems to have a 5,000 bucks coffee machine nowadays, but um, I've been, I started to, uh, to be into coffee really early on when we have been always uh, to, to holidays to Lago di Hidro, uh, Hidro Se, um, and uh, my dad bought a really, really old uh, espresso machine um, when I was a young boy. So the first coffee was not a shitty German filter coffee, but a real Italian espresso. So therefore, I got hooked um, pretty early on. So yeah, it's a lot of small things. <laughs> I'm sure Marcello understands being an Italian. I think he has a passion for coffee. Um, yeah, thanks to the work of Try Dubai, we have obviously an ever-growing community of, of triathletes and, and a lot of questions we got was obviously the secrets of, of success and I, I want to ask you just if I give you one topic and you tell me, listen, this would be a tip you would give someone, just a quick one and I say, what would you think is the most important before a race as a preparation? Um, I think the most important thing is to have a routine. Um, to, to stick to a routine because it, it helps you a lot to stay calm. It's, it helps a lot to avoid mistakes if you always try to keep the same routine. And so obviously it's difficult at the beginning when you start racing to have a routine, but over the years you start to learn what's your routine. And I think it's important to, to make a list probably like for example, I know all the meals I going to have in the whole week. So I don't have to think about, okay, what I going to eat on Thursday evening or whatever, or what I going to eat on, on Saturday evening. And uh, so you also don't need to, uh, you know, freak up out about what you, uh, what you, uh, what you're going to buy at the grocery and, and so on. 
And it's the same with, uh, with training, obviously. For the important races, I think it's very important to have a routine um, where you know, okay, that's the week I'm going to do before the race. And I stick to that. And then, of course, sometimes you have to make uh, small adjustments because the weather is not so good or the pool is closed or whatsoever. But in generally, um, try to stick to routine. That's important. That's a very German approach. I like. <laughs> very good. Uh, for the swim, any tips you would give swimmers when they start for their first event? Yes. Uh, <laughs> obviously, it's interesting because... Um, I, I think I can come forward with quite a lot of good advice with swimming because I'm struggling a lot with swimming myself. Um, therefore, I spend a lot of time thinking about swimming. And I think the most important thing is get a real coach when it comes to swimming because that's really something um, what, what it's very difficult to teach yourself. You know, I mean, cycling... It's not, it's, it's actually not that hard. I mean, and you can just learn a lot by watch other people uh, ride their bikes. You know, even if you would just look at the, a bike race or whatsoever, you just look how the pros ride their bikes and you can, you can learn a lot. But swimming, I would say, have a coach that teaches you the right technique, um, saves you a lot of time and a lot of... Um, yeah, a lot of uh, bad experiences when it comes to, to swimming. And um, that's that's something important, I think. Very good. On the bike, you mentioned already a few things. What, do you, what is your tip for the bike? Buy a squat bike, obviously, number one. But anything <laughs> yes, else? actually, um, yeah, love the bike is, is something something that's important. Become one with it. And um, that's that's important. Um, I think what I, I mean, of course, there are hundred, I would, <laughs> we can keep, keep talking for at least an hour with all the, the advice I can give. But the thing is, I, I see a lot of guys and they already have like a, a very good position on the bike. But mm -hmm. the, the biggest um, problem is they can't maintain the position for 180K. And um, that's like the biggest advantage you can get for free is, if you are, especially if you're getting tired, you know, I mean, the people, they ride on, in the arrow position for the first two and a half hours, but when they get tired, they start to get out of the arrow position, but that's where you actually want to be the most slippery, mm -hmm. the most arrow, you know, so therefore, when you get tired, you have to maintain the position and you only learn that by riding the position. And um, especially now, some people are, now allowed to go outside again and so on but um especially on the trainer i mean a lot of people spend a lot of time on swift try to ride the position try to ride the position as often as possible um try to make some intervals like whatever um 10 times uh 10 minutes for example and you always ride the position eight minutes and then you can ride on the on the base bar for two minutes um but you need to try to ride the position. And also I see a lot of people when they train, they train in a group with their TT bike, but they never train in the position. So that's the problem. Like guys, <laughs> if you want to be fast, you need to be able to maintain the position. And that's the biggest uh, difference. So, yeah. Very good. Very good. Okay, and then we're coming to the run. What's a good tip to survive the run? <laughs> um, I mean, the, the biggest problem I think a lot of people have is not really related to running because they, they are probably really good runners when they run um, like their everyday run training. And then they are quite shocked how slow they run in an in a Ironman or whatsoever. And that's most of the times more related to energy. And I mean, that's the biggest problem for like pretty much everybody is it's nice if you have a ferrari engine you know that's awesome but if you have if you're on empty and there's nothing in your in your fuel tank anymore the ferrari is not going anywhere anymore so therefore the most prob the biggest problem that people have with running is most of the times related to energy so therefore usually i always think the people um, did something wrong with the nutrition on the bike and also at the start of the run. Um, I can only recommend to uh, really try to get your nutrition dialed in. 
if you are not able to get in like 80 to 100 grams of carbohydrate per hour, you need to work on that. That's important. And um, also on the run is it's really important to practice to drink and and uh, and eat or at, at mm. least have gels during the run. I see a lot of people they do their long runs. And they don't drink and eat anything because it's very difficult to organize. But then I would just recommend to whatever, when you do a two hour run in your training session, you probably do a one hour loop and then you do like three 20 minute loops and have your bottle ready like every loop. And then you try to really get the energy in because it's not that easy on the bike. It's usually easy to eat, but on the run, it's very difficult. So I would say that's my advice for running, even if it doesn't really have to do anything with running. Mm -hmm. Very good. Recovery. Uh, I think you, you do a lot of, you, you said actually uh, surround yourself with positive people uh, and feeling happy is the best recovery. Yeah, it is. 100%. I mean, um, uh, I mean it's, it's really interesting, um, like all the companies that try to sell you uh, all sorts of like recovery tools, but also there, the most important thing is sleep um how you get a good sleep is by trying to go to bed to at the same time wake up at the same time pretty much every day that's really important um try to don't use your e-reader or, or computer before you go to bed um try to don't have any coffee and that's really difficult for me obviously after like four or five o'clock um for me it's obviously i always make that mistake have a coffee after dinner and then oh <laughs> it's another wake up late in the night um that's not good and then um yeah like i said i mean you know obviously food is very important um but it's not only what you eat it's also how you eat you know like i said like try to eat slow with your family um food you prepared yourself is very important and then of course there's a lot of small things you can do extra like for example, Normatec, um, a lot of people know that that tool, especially when you travel and um, those are the foods that you put on and um, they get pumped up and, uh, you know, they, they uh, um, increase the blood flow a little bit that something like this might help. It also helps because the people have to calm down for 30 minutes, you know, I mean, that's something you, you can, you mm -hmm. can underestimate. It's like, um, a lot of those tools, if they just help you to, you know, stay put for half an hour and relax a little bit, it helps a lot. And um, yes, and then obviously uh, nutrition. I mean, um, yeah, I just came back from <laughs> from the pool and then uh, sometimes it's not that easy to have like a whole meal. So um, a protein shake, I have the um, uh, power bar protein plus it's um, two to one um, carbohydrates and protein. It helps uh, for sure. But a normal meal also does the job. But um, yes, it's just important to at one point eat something after uh, your workout. Very good. Very good. You said as well uh, that tried needs invented burnout. I think <laughs> yes. as well, taking it easy and, and just uh, obviously adjusting what you do to your regular life because obviously you're, you're the you're a professional and you concentrate fully, but I think for a lot of people, obviously the mix out of rest and training and nutrition is obviously super important. Yeah, 100%. I mean, it's crazy uh, to see some of the people, um, I mean, they're amateurs out there and they train more than me, but they have a normal uh, daily job, you know, and work for 45, 50 hours a week, but then also squeeze in 25 hours of training and they have a family with kids. Obviously, this is not going to work out too long. At one point, you're definitely going to burn out or you're not going to, um, you know, perform either in your job with your family or in the sport or in all three. So at one point, you have to have a certain balance and you have to give yourself the, the freedom to, to relax and also enjoy downtime. You know, a lot mm -hmm. of people always, they're they're always linked to like, if I take a rest, it's, it's time I lose. It's time mm -hmm. not well spent. Um, and I know, I know this feeling. It's not, it's not easy sometimes, but over the years, I realized it's actually quite important. And I started to really enjoy uh, rest days and downtime. And I, I don't have any problem, you know, to, to take a rest and, uh, and really enjoy it. And that's important. 
Mm -hmm. Very good, fantastic. What's next for you? Uh, what's the next event? What are you looking forward to? <laughs> well, if I could only say, um, I mean, the next thing, so um, Germany seems, or all over Europe seems to, uh, seems to open their borders at the 15th of uh, June. So we'll probably gonna do a big uh, training block in, in Livigno, um, in the, yeah, in the, in the Alps um, and in St. Moritz. Um, so a little bit uh, time in the, in the altitude and also some really nice uh, bike riding over there. Um, that's what we, uh, what we're gonna do next training wise. And then obviously I'm hoping for some of the races uh, to happen. I mean, some of the main events I, I have on my schedule would be uh, um, uh, Challenge Samorin, the championship, um, the PTO world championship. Then it's still not clear if Ironman Frankfurt is probably gonna happen in September. It would be awesome for me um, because obviously a lot of people still need to validate. But um, yeah, and then of course, uh, Ironman Hawaii in, in 2021, first edition in February uh, and a couple of smaller races. But um, yeah, I mean, it's all like nobody knows what, what's going to happen or what's not going to happen. Um, it's just linked to to what the people are doing now in their everyday life if i see the the our park here it's already packed so of course i'm a little bit concerned that um maybe we have a second outbreak of uh, covid 19 and then shit all goes down to drain again but uh you know that's the thing is um Obviously, uh, um, a lot of the people in professional sports struggle, but in, in triathlon, like I said, it's not like linked that strongly to TV, like, for example, cycling is. If the Tour de France is not going to happen, mm -hmm. they miss out on 50% of their exposure and the sponsors won't be happy, you know, I mean, they will stop paying them and that's already already happening. And of course, for us, it's the same thing. I'm not getting paid for, for my everyday training. I'm getting paid to win, win races and have um, exposure for my, uh, for my sponsors. But um, yeah, I mean, some of it is possible today over via social media. And, you know, for example, being on your show, <laughs> proud to represent. <laughs> um, no, but then, uh, then it's also... Um, in, in, in our sport, it's, it's the people are still riding the bikes. And I mean, you, yeah, well, so you probably know um, uh, the people still want to go outside and ride their bike and, and run and, and so on. So therefore, uh, some competition might be canceled, but sport is not canceled. You know, sport is yeah. still happening. Sport is still very important. And it's probably even more important than ever, you know. I mean, in Germany, I have seen so many people work, work out outside. I've probably not seen that many people work outside before. And that's really important because even with a global disease spreading like this, the most important thing is that the people are fit and healthy. And yeah. how do you stay fit and healthy is maintaining a healthy lifestyle and doing sport, you know. And that's, that's really it. So therefore, sport is not canceled. <laughs> Fantastic. Listen, I'm only halfway through my list, but I think we, we give you another chance for you to come on. I have, I have a few more questions just to, to finish this off, and I want yeah. to be respectful of your time because in my first message, I said half an hour. I think we're now like one hour 15. <laughs> um, if you write a book about your career, what's going to be the title? Oh, I don't have a question uh, and answer for that yet because my career is still still going on and i'm not gonna write a book halfway through so i wait for so the app to yet. give it a title <laughs> yeah, the title is maybe not done yet yeah probably very good the best things to come not very good um who do you think is so far besides you the greatest tribe lead of all times i have to say jan frodeno to be honest um mm -hmm. not because he's he's a friend of mine and uh, he 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 kicked my butt a couple of times but i mean the thing is, he won Olympic Games and mm -hmm. Hawaii a couple of times, actually. I mean, Hawaii. He has the world record or the world's best um, whatsoever. And I mean, that's something in our sport, the, mo the two most important races. And nobody else has done that yet. Of course, there are people that won more races. For example, 
maybe Javi Gomez won way more races. And, um, but, you know, he didn't won an Olympic title and he has not won Ironman Hawaii yet. So I have to say it's Jan. Very good, very good. That's very respectful. Yeah, very nice. Uh, if you go for karaoke to sing a song, what song would you pick? <laughs> I think I can tell that here. <laughs> uh, I usually like um, I, I like punk rock a lot, and um, uh, so it would be it would be something with a political message, probably. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. We we leave it to that. <laughs> very good. Very good. Um, do you have a favorite quote you live by? Uh, no, I, to be honest, I mean, there, there are a lot of great quotes out there mm -hmm. for sure. Um, but, uh, you know, you will find one that fits for every day. It's, uh, it's crazy. So therefore I, I don't live by quotes. Very good. Um, and if you can spend a day with a person dead or alive, um, who would that be? Oh, um, I have to say it's probably Richard Feynman. <laughs> uh, he's probably none of the guys um, who are listening um, uh, have a clue who that is. Maybe yeah. some are Googling it right now. He's, uh, he's a guy um, that, that was really uh, talented in, in physics and a really, really smart guy. Uh, not as famous as, uh, for example, Einstein or uh, Marie Curie or wh whoever, but uh, yeah, um, somebody, uh, I, I read a couple of books about him and um, yeah, he seemed to be a, a crazy guy. I think um, he would he would have been the, the Elon Musk um, of today's time, uh, probably multiplied by two. <laughs> very cool, very cool. So... Sebastian, I was very excited about that talk and I thought it's going to be something amazing and I think we're going to speak about a lot of things, but I think you, you trumped it all and, and I want to thank you for your time and we are, we are way into the time already. So um, I'm really excited and I hope we're going to see you in Dubai. Maybe we have to arrange a camp. Maybe we have to see you for uh, 70.3 in Dubai. So I think the people really get to know you now and, and they would be super excited to, to have you over here. So uh, maybe stop with your family or whatever. So you're always very welcome. Uh, to obviously see us here in Dubai and uh, we, we're really looking forward to see you racing uh, soon again. Thanks a lot Wolfie for, for having me and thanks to everybody uh, uh, watching and I know that there are a lot of uh, crazy guys um, down there uh, when it comes to bikes and, and cars and that's also something I love and uh, so yeah therefore I definitely have to have to be be there one one day not just at the airport but uh, probably in your in your shop and uh, um, yeah we have a coffee together and look at some of the of, of your nice bikes <laughs> thank you so much so thanks that's fantastic um, we have our next guest um, I think a very special person as well and I, I maybe I give some of his stats multiple world champion gold medalist three times Paris Roubaix winner uh, three times Tour of Flanders. He's from Switzerland. He won the Tour of Switzerland, Tour of Oman, stages in the Tour de France. You know who it is? Yeah, of course. <laughs> Fabian Cancellara. I'm of super course, excited. The Spartan. The Spartan. Um, on the 4th, it's Thursday uh, in a week, uh, 7 o'clock. So we're super excited. And um, obviously, that's, that's again the cycling, but as well the time trialing side of the sport um, and after that I can't give it away who we have afterwards but we have a very special person uh, tribe lead coming uh, after that so all the tribe leads thank you for watching uh, thanks for for all the people from try to buy they even moved their ride this evening I heard that they can listen to the show so thank cool. you very much and uh, thanks again Sebastian this has been really amazing you're a cool guy thank you thanks for having me thank you Bye. Good evening. thank you everyone good night <laughs>